Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Ana Restrepo. I'm a certified wound ostomy nurse at the University of Miami Hospital and Clinics. It is my pleasure to be here tonight and I'm truly excited for this meeting that we have prepared for you tonight. I will be your host and I'm ecstatic about the fantastic speaker and the topic that we have for this session. These meetings are dedicated to all of you out there who have an ostomy, to your family, your friends, your caregivers. The mission of these support group meetings is to provide you with education, support, and bring all ostomates together so that you successfully transition into living a full life with an ostomy. Before I introduce our guest speaker for the night, I wanna mention that you will have the opportunity to submit your questions and comments in a box located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You will get all the answers at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also wanna mention that if you like to turn on the live transcription closed captioning feature, all you have to do is select the CC live transcription button at the bottom of the Zoom screen and click on show subtitles. Now, allow me to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Michelle Perlman. Dr. Perlman is an assistant profession, professor, excuse me, in the Division of Digestive and Liver Diseases at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. She received her degree her medical degree from Wake Forest University School of Medicine, completed her internal medicine internship and residency at the University of California, San Diego, and her gastroenterology and hepatology fellowship at the University of Texas Southwestern. Dr. Perlman is a physician nutrition specialist and board certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology, and obesity medicine. Her mission is to educate the community on the fundamentals of wellness and nutrition, and she works closely with numerous subspecialties, including bariatrics, hepatology, endocrinology, sleep medicine, sports medicine, oncology, dietetics, to provide comprehensive care for patients with nutritional issues whether it will be malnutrition or obesity. Dr. Perlman has helped organize numerous nutrition-related seminars throughout the University of Miami community to improve access to care and improve nutrition education to students, staff, and the community at large. She's also a celebrity. She has been featured in numerous TV channels newspapers and, and radio appearances, including WIOD Radio News, the Miami Herald, Good Housekeeping, Florida Trends Magazine, NBC, and the CW Inside South Florida. We are so fortunate to have you all with, with us tonight, Dr. Perlman. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here educating our patients in nutrition, hydration, something that is so important for the well-being. So we are all very excited to hear you speaking tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to let you take it away, Dr. Perlman. Awesome, Anna. Thank you so much for that introduction. You know, in my, I don't know, 12, 16 years worth of training, um, no one really ever sat me down and taught me nutrition. And I think part of that is it's not really built within our, you know, education when it comes to being a medical provider. Um, and for a lot of the GI patients or surgical patients who have had a surgery, you know, it can get very complicated. It's not just about eating healthy, but it's eating for your body. And often as we get older and we're on certain medications or have certain surgeries, our body is vastly different than what it used to be. And I think you know, as our body changes, our nutrition has to be just as dynamic. And that's the challenge. But it's also um, a really, really big reward in, you know, when I can help patients learn how to eat so that they don't actually have to take a ton of medications. And that is possible even having an ostomy. 
Um, so today we're really going to focus on the nutritional management for patients with ostomies. And it doesn't matter if you have one currently, you've had one in the past, or you're going to have one. I think all of these little tips and tricks can definitely help um, all of the above and, and in particular caregivers as well. Okay, so I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest. Um, so today we're going to talk about the basics, so normal gastrointestinal structure and function, what to expect when you get an ostomy, potential complications of having high ostomy output, and then really focusing on using food as medicine, dietary recommendations for those with an ostomy. Um, I can't, you know, our, as a healthcare provider, we can't expect patients and caregivers to know what is abnormal if we don't even understand what is normal. And so that is absolutely critical. So again, first we're gonna talk about the basics, normal structure and function. So what is the gut consist of? We have the gut epithelium, we have the gut associated lymphoid tissue. A lot of people forget that the gut is our, our largest immune organ. And so what we eat truly has a huge impact our, on our immunity. We have the enteric nervous system. So when people say they have kind of an anxious stomach or butterflies in their stomach, when we have anxiety, that affects the, the neurotransmitters that, that um, basically send signals to our gut and can alter bowel habits. And so that's a true phenomenon where when people say, I have butterflies in my belly, that's because of anxiety in those neurotransmitters. And then really an organ within itself is the microbiome. Billions and billions of bacteria in our small intestine and in our colon um, have a huge impact on our health as well as disease. So when we talk about the normal length of the GI tract, it really varies if you're looking at an autopsy specimen versus if you're in an operating room and you're measuring it um, from certain points because when you're when you have an open belly, you don't have access to the entire intestine. So those measurements are going to vary just a little bit. Um, but the normal intestinal length is really achieved by the age of around nine. Um, when you're comparing men versus women, men in general have a longer length of the small intestine, but not by very much. So men typically around 600 to 30 centimeters of small bowel, women a little under 600 centimeters. The majority of the small intestine is made up of the jejunum. That's about nine to 10 feet or 360 centimeters. And then you have the ileum, which is about seven to eight feet and the colon, which is really the shortest amount of all. Um, about four to five feet. So again, the majority of your small intestine is going to vary a little bit, but around 600 centimeters, and the majority of that is jejunum. People who suffer from things like short gut syndrome or short bowel will often have less than 200 centimeters of small intestine remaining. So that's going to kind of put things a little bit here into perspective. So what is the role of these small bowel segments and why does it matter if I say the jejunum is the majority and, and the ileum is less? And that's because not all small intestine is created equal. So when you're looking at the duodenum, that's where you have a lot of calcium and vitamin D and iron absorption. Those who have had a gastric bypass because you bypass that part of the small intestine will quite commonly get iron deficiency anemia. Um, the jejunum does most of the absorption, the proximal or the first portion of the jejunum. And then the ileum is really important for bile acid reabsorption and B12 absorption. So again, why does this matter? Well, it depends on where your ostomy is. So if you have an end ileostomy and you still have all of your ileum remaining and it's normal ileum, then you shouldn't have any issues with B12 or bile acid reabsorption. But if you have an end jejunostomy, where you don't have any of the ileum, then you're likely or you will need B12 supplementation um, injections. Um, and, and so that's very important to really pre, um, prophylactically start supplementing things that you're likely going to go down significantly on, depending on your anatomy. Um, um, the, the other reason why this is very important is because if you lose um, your ileum, that can have um, quite a few... Um, issues later on. The ileum doesn't absorb as much, but it can adapt. So it can do functions. If you, let's say you lost your jejunum, the ileum can take up some of the functions of the jejunum, but it doesn't work the opposite. So if you lose your ileum, although the jejunum 
reabsorbs most of your water or liquid, um, the jejunum cannot take on the actions of the ileum. So if you have all your jejunum, but none of your ileum, you will still have issues with B12, um, with, with low B12. So that's why the segments are important um, to really understand your anatomy. And I want to really um, I want to encourage all of you that have an ostomy or if you're a caregiver to really take ownership of this um, and understand what your anatomy is and ask questions. Because if you end up going to different institutions, it's very challenging actually on the provider end to truly understand what someone's anatomy is, particularly if they've had a multiple surgeries and revisions. Um, so whatever information you have as far as what part of your small intestine was taken out and what's hooked up to what um, can be very, very helpful when you seek care with your providers. So let's talk about normal fluid balance so that we understand what is normal when it comes to how much should be in your bag as far as fluid and stool. So we typically on average will take in about two liters of fluid a day. You make saliva. So even if you're not eating, your body still produces saliva. That's about 1.5 liters per day. Your stomach, it makes gastric juices. So gastric acid, that's about two and a half liters per day. Your pancreas, your liver, um, it makes pancreatic enzymes that help break down certain foods. The bile is produced by your liver that helps. It's, it's kind of acts like a detergent or a soap to break down fats. And your intestine also makes fluid. And so all in all, your body makes um, about nine liters of fluid, believe it or not. And that's, you know, you, even if you're not eating, you're still producing, let's say about seven liters. So your body is still making fluid. Um, and so your intestine, your small intestine and your colon reabsorb the majority of that. So when someone who has normal bowel, no underlying issues with digestion or absorption, everything is hooked up just like they were born. The net loss is only going to be about 100 mLs. So that's normal because most of your output is going to be solid stool and you're not losing fluid through your intestine. Okay, so that is normal physiology. So general principles to help kind of frame what we're going to be talking on, on what to expect and what is abnormal is that digestion means breaking down molecules. So that mostly occurs in the duodenum, um, also some in the stomach. Most of your absorption occurs in the duodenum and in the first portion of the jejunum. So you've broken down the molecules, whether it's fat, protein, or carbs, and now you're ready to absorb it through the intestine into the bloodstream. After surgery, you will typically have more issues with fluid and electrolyte depletion. That is what is going to happen initially. But over time, the amazing thing about the bowel is its ability to adapt. So over time, within the first one to two years post-surgery, your intestine is able to adapt and that function will improve. So with time, you will end up losing less fluid and less electrolytes. Um, so all in all, digestion is not the problem. It is a transit problem. Things end up moving faster through your gut you get less time to absorb those nutrients and fluid. You have less bowel, less surface area to absorb those nutrients in that fluid. And so the management goal, whether it pertains to nutritional recommendations or antidiarrheals or other medications are really primarily focused in how do we keep the food in contact with the remaining mucosal surface for as long as possible? And how do we increase the mucosal surface area? So in those that have an ostomy, um, you want to reconnect them as soon as you're able to, because if you're able to then connect the small bowel to the remaining colon or whatever surgery was done, then you end up getting more mucosal surface area to get more, more availability and more time for fluid reabsorption. So the importance of the ileocecal valve, also known as the IC valve, is multifold. Um, it, it actually, and this is where your small intestine connects to your colon. Why is this valve important? Well, you actually, it kind of, it's like a, so it's, it's called a valve. So it slows the emptying from the small intestine into the colon. And it actually um, influences certain hormones that slow down transit through the intestine, that's called the ileal break. It affects hormones like GLP-1 that again, slow transit through the bowel. Um, 
You get better intestinal adaptation when you have the valve there. Most of the bacteria is in the colon. You still have bacteria in the small intestine, but less bacteria in the small intestine. And so that valve helps prevent the reflux of, of all those billions of bacteria in the colon into the small bowel. So it prevents a phenomenon called SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So typically surgeons, if they can, will try to leave the IC valve intact to help prevent some of these and again, help reduce the amount of output. Now, having a retained colon is again, very important. Um, the colon, just like the small intestine, has the ability to adapt. Um, so over time, the colon will actually dilate. It can get longer. The cells can proliferate. It can actually, um, typically, if the colon only reabsorbs about one to two liters over time as it adapts, it can actually increase its capacity to absorb fluid and, and actually increase to four liters per day. So if you have an intact colon or at least a partial colon there, then that can definitely help reduce the amount of output. Um, and so those that have an intact colon, if they just have a, you know, a colostomy, will be less likely to require either enteral or parenteral nutrition, so either a feeding tube or, or nutrition through the vein. Now, what's also interesting is that um, dietary fiber, um, basically you feed the bacteria in your gut, the microbiome, and it can actually produce what's called short-chain fatty acids. And those short chain fatty acids, the colon can actually absorb them and actually create calories. So you end up, if you're not able to take in 3000 calories a day, having a retained colon and being able to produce these short chain fatty acids actually helps you get more energy. So more calories to help um, prevent excessive weight loss. So gut autonomy is really the person's ability and the gut's ability to kind of function on its own and not need things like TPN or nutrition through the vein. Um, again, that is going to be determined by the length and the quality of the remaining bowel. So when someone who has Crohn's disease and they may have an endileostomy because they had a significant stricture, um, if they have an endileostomy but, they, but the patient still has disease of the ileum, um, then they may not have actually a lot of quality bowel remaining. And so although they may have 400 or 600 centimeters of their, in, of their small intestine, if 200 of those centimeters are diseased, then they may have issues with high output. Um, again, the intestinal adaptation takes time and it, it can take up to one to two years after a surgery to really reduce the amount of output electrolyte disturbances. So factors that influence that intestinal adaptation or ability to reduce the amount of output and electrolyte disturbances are age. What is the underlying intestinal disease? Does someone have radiation enteritis and a lot of their bowel is not necessarily healthy? Do they have Crohn's disease? Um, or was it just an intestinal trauma? Part of their bowel had to be removed while things are healing. They need an ostomy, but the rest of the remaining bowel is healthy. So that's very important. Again, what is the length of the remaining bowel? Is it 200 centimeters versus 600 centimeters? Do they have that IC valve intact? Do they have a colon intact? Are things connected or are they not connected? Um, what sort of nutrition support do they have in intestinal rehab? The patient compliance. Um, um, these things are challenging to have an ostomy and to, you know, it's, it's honestly a full-time job to really feed your body well. You have to eat several times a day takes a lot of time, a lot of resources. You have to educate yourself. Um, and so it can be a challenge. So it's not necessarily that we're saying patients are non-compliant. It's hard for anyone. Um, and then obviously, you know, social determinants and budgets and things like that, access to healthcare, um, all of these things are critically important in whether or not someone is going to have great intestinal adaptation. So what should we expect with an ostomy? It does not have to be a negative experience. I think as long as you understand the basics and really advocate for yourself and ask questions, um, people can do perfectly fine. Um, so months following surgery, um, again, up until about a year, your intestine is gonna go through a lot of changes. You get pouch adaptation, the storage capacity will increase over time. And again, with time, your bowel frequency will decrease 
and the output will thicken over time. But again, this does not happen overnight. So I don't want people to get discouraged that while they're still in the hospital recuperating, they, you know, they think that that's going to be their life. It is not. Um, these things do improve over time. So what sort of output are we going to expect in the ostomy? Well, again, you know, one of the driving factors is how much bowel is remaining and what exactly, what, it, what is the anatomy? So if someone has, let's say, an end jejunostomy, they have much less bowel because they're missing their ilia and, and they don't have a retained colon there. Um, so they may expect about six liters per day. So patients with an end jejunostomy are really going to need enteral nutrition and, and really they're, they're at least in the first couple of months will we'll need TPN just because of all those fluid and electrolyte losses. Um, those with an end ileostomy, it's going to be initially about a, a 1.5 liters to expect. That is normal. And then again, over time with intestinal adaptation, it may actually go under less than a liter per day. And then a colostomy, as long as you have normal, um, well-functioning, small intestine, a colostomy is about 200 mLs to 600 mLs. So not that much, because remember in a normal person with normal anatomy and normal structure and function, I said we expect about 100 mLs. So with a colostomy, it's obviously a little bit more than that, but not significantly so. So what are some potential complications of high ostomy output? Why do we make such a big deal out of this? Um, so people will obviously have diarrhea or loss of fat in their stool. That's called steatorrhea. This will lead to dehydration and unintentional weight loss. Malnutrition, again, at least in the beginning, you're going to have, um, you know, definitely um, some, some electrolyte disturbances. So vitamin and mineral deficiencies and electrolyte abnormalities. So this is why it's important because if we can, you know, um, improve the surface area, um, um, make the transit time longer, then all of these things will improve. So again, why do we care about high ostomy output? It is associated with increased morbidity and mortality, more hospital visits and ER visits. Um, part of the issue is because everyone's anatomy is very different and everyone's intestinal health is very different, that there's such high variability in the care um, and management um, and that's why it's a challenge, at least when it comes to studying patients and what is the best route of management. It's very difficult because the patient population is very, very heterogeneous. Um, and then it really requires a multidisciplinary approach and patient self-care. These things are essential. We can give people the most glorious plan in the world, but it's not, if it's not realistic for someone and if it's not communicated with them to the point that people truly understand and the caregivers understand, then these things just don't work. So what is diarrhea? It's about, you know, over 250 grams of stool per day. I don't think anyone is really um, putting their, their stool on a scale. Um, but for most people, again, it's going to be uh, over a liter and a half or so of output per day, at least for your ileostomy patients. Um, and then steatorrhea is if we're measuring the fat content, that's because of fat maldigestion, they'll lose seven grams of fat per day. Um, and so that's, that's the term steatorrhea. So diarrhea and steatorrhea, which is high output liquidy stool. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what I think is the really fun part where we can use food as medicine to treat patients with ostomies and really prevent a lot of these complications. Um, my kind of quote um, or kind of line that I live by, and really if I'm teaching people with ostomies about their condition or patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease or people trying to lose weight, it doesn't matter the condition, but I truly believe that if you want to feel well, you need to eat well, not just today and not just tomorrow and not just for 30 days, but consistently. Um, other things to keep in mind are that not all calories are created equal. So often when people are losing weight or not feeling well, it is very common for people to say, just eat whatever you can get down, eat whatever you like so that you're not losing weight. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm just, I'm not a fan of that because if you're lactose intolerant and you just had an ostomy surgery and you're drinking down tons of milkshakes, you're gonna feel awful. And so I'm not a proponent of just eating whatever you can or eating whatever you like. 
Um, just like if someone takes a medication and they don't feel well, they have a side effect, we will often tell people that maybe we should stop the medication. I look at it the same way when we talk about food. If you eat or drink something and it makes you feel ill, that's your body telling you it's probably not going to bode well for you. Um, it's the same thing as a medication, but food is just not in capsule form. But it's the same exact thing. We're putting it into our mouth and it's going into our body. Um, another important kind of tip that I really want to focus on is how you eat is just as important as what you eat. So I am guilty of this. I don't know about you all. I shovel down my food in between patients because I have five minutes to eat. And it may have nothing to do with what I ate, but the mere fact that I literally inhaled my food, I didn't chew it. It's I have undigested food molecules going into my stomach. I get bloated. I may have to run to the bathroom. It may have nothing to do with what I ate. It may have everything to do with how fast I ate and how much air I swallowed when I gulped that food down. Um, so really trying to spend 20 to 30 minutes per meal to really allow for adequate digestion and absorption is absolutely critical. Even if it means setting a timer on your phone and saying, I'm not gonna get up from this table until I've sat here for 20 minutes and really you know, chewed my food, um, that's, that's I, I can't stress the importance enough. And so when you're chewing your food, kind of an easy way to do it is really you want to chew your food until you can no longer feel the consistency of the food in your mouth. It should basically feel like liquid before you swallow it. So immediately post-op, and this is going to vary depending on the institution and whoever the, um, the surgeon is that did the surgery, but for the most part, they're going to put you on a clear liquid diet. They will advance as you are able to tolerate. And this is really gonna depend on the timing of when you start having mouth sounds, when you start passing gas, and when you start passing stool through the ostomy. It's extremely variable if you're on a PCA, like a pain pump or other forms of medication, um, that will also influence how fast your bowels kind of wake up after the surgery. So it's gonna vary from person to person. Um, you will slowly reintroduce new foods um, this will take at least six to eight weeks for you to kind of get in a little bit of regular fiber, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Everyone is different. And this is also going to depend on what your body was able to tolerate pre-surgery. So if you weren't able to tolerate apples and peaches and spinach before surgery, you're likely not going to tolerate it after. So one of the key things when we talk about how to use food as medicine is, again, it's not just about eating calories to get calories. We want to be able to focus on consuming calorie-dense and nutrient-dense foods. So these would be things like healthy fats, like nut butters, avocado, hummus, not fried food, low FODMAP foods, and we'll go into those in, in more detail. You want to definitely cook or puree your fruits and vegetables, at least in the beginning, you always want to prioritize protein. Protein is the only macronutrient that your body cannot function without. Um, and so you never want to have like your bread or your rice first. You always want to have your protein first. And then if you're still hungry, then you can eat the other stuff. But really protein is most important. And for most people, it's going to equate to about 60 to 80 grams of protein per day. Um, at least initially, you're going to want to eat small portions every two hours or so in order to reach your daily calorie and protein needs. And you want to choose proteins that are easier to digest. So you don't want to go into a big hunk of steak. You want to start with things like wild caught fish or scrambled eggs, things that are broken down um, much more easy. The, you know, the chicken and the meat that is kind of harder to digest um, that stuff can be a little bit more difficult to tolerate. So definitely don't go into that from the, from the get-go. Um, and then another key point here is that too much of a good thing can actually be a bad thing. So although I'm saying prioritize protein, you can't go from getting a surgery, clear liquids, and then having a 16, um, 16 ounce um, ribeye. That just is not going to work. Same thing for fiber. You can't go from surgery, clear liquids, to a quinoa bowl with flax seeds and chia seeds and nuts and avocado on the side. It's just, is not going to work for you. So again, I can't reiterate the importance enough of slow introduction of these foods um, um, really as you're going through that intestinal adaptation phase. And again, this can take 
weeks, months, and for some people, one to two years after surgery. So some of my tips and tricks to kind of summarize a lot of the stuff that we've touched upon, you want to start with simple carbs, rice, white potatoes, again, prioritize the lean protein, slowly introduce the dietary fiber as you're able to tolerate one at a time, assess for your tolerance. So you don't want to add sweet potatoes and pumpkin and spinach and kale and nuts all on day one. You want to start with something that you knew you tolerated pre-op. So if you really like pureed pumpkin, then that may be something that you start with after your surgery. You do that for three days, you see how you do, you see how it affects your stool output, and then you say, okay, I'm gonna add that to my go-to list. I did fine with the pumpkin puree, now I'm gonna add a sweet potato. And then you add that into your um, kind of arsenal of, of, of food options. And if you do that with a few, well for a few days, then you move on to the next thing. But the more consistent and and as long as you have a strategy with this, it is much more um, palatable, pun intended, and much easier to identify those GI intolerances. If you add in five things at a time and you're eating really fast and you're not really being mindful of what's going on, then there's you can go to your provider and say, I'm having diarrhea and I don't know what happened. If you come to me and say that, I'll say, I don't know what happened either because the introduction was way too fast. So again, the more strategic you can be about this, the the easier it is to identify um, certain foods that may be causing an issue. You want to cook down your fruits and vegetables very well, limit the raw stuff, at least initially. Um, I will often steam um, like riced cauliflower and I'll put it in a blender and I literally make like a mashed potato, but with cauliflower. And so that's, that um, for many people can be easily tolerated. You want to avoid these high FODMAP foods, FODMAP foods are um, kind of poorly digested carbohydrates that the bacteria in our gut, when they break them down, form gas molecules and they can increase bloating and a lot of gas in your ostomy bag. Um, So although cauliflower and broccoli are healthy and have good fiber, they will cause a lot of bloating. So those would not be vegetables that you want to introduce, at least in the beginning. You want to avoid excessive air swallowing because again, we want to reduce the amount of gas that's in your ostomy bag. So that, um, so things, you know, like quote unquote normal behaviors or things that we think are normal, like chewing gum or candies, adding artificial sweeteners to our coffee, anything with carbonation. I don't care if it's diet or regular. I don't care if it's sparkling water or a soda stream. There are bubbles in those liquids. And when you ingest those bubbles, you're just putting excessive air into your ostomy bag and intestine. Um, And then you also definitely want to remove um, lactose. Most people are actually lactose intolerant. It is actually normal to lose the lactase enzyme in the small intestine as we get older. So particularly after surgery, even if you tolerated milk and soft cheeses before surgery, you most definitely will not tolerate those things after. So I'm not saying you have to cut out all dairy, but at least get rid of the lactose containing dairy items. And that's typically going to be your cow's milk and your soft cheeses. You want to avoid fried foods and creamy sauces, excessive seasonings and marinades, remove the seeds and the skins from your fruits and vegetables. And then it's very important if you can to really have this food diary, track your food, track your liquids, the timing of when you're eating, the timing of when you're drinking. And then we can, and then if you're feeling bloated or if you're having a lot of output, then you can bring that to your provider and then your provider can say, okay, Let's see if we can identify some patterns here. It looks like that every time you drink X, Y, and Z, or every time you eat something, um, it looks like on those days you end up having two liters of output. So why don't we take out those two things and let's see how your output changes. And so having a food diary can be very important um, because um, our ability to um, give a provider an accurate dietary recall and remember everything we ate and drank and the timing is extremely poor. And so the more that you can document, um, it's really much easier for you and your provider to figure out what some of the issues may be. So are all liquids created equal? The answer is no. And what exactly does it mean to hydrate? Um, Even when I was kind of preparing for this talk, I was going on a lot of academic university websites and um, just a lot of information online. And it says hydrate, 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 you know, drink, you know, two liters of of fluid a day. But 
what fluid you're supposed to be drinking is very ambiguous. And what exactly does it mean to hydrate? Um, so here we're going to talk about fluid balance. So in a normal bowel, your sodium is reabsorbed in the distal part of your small intestine. But what if you don't have the distal part of your small intestine? Then you're going to lose a lot of sodium. Um, hyperosmolar fluids, that would be things like sports drinks, Powerade, Gatorade, um, soda, concentrated fruit juices. Those have a lot of sugar, but not enough salt. And so what happens is, is although they are marketed as hydration solutions, they actually do not have the perfect combination or the perfect ratio of sodium and glucose. And so what happens is, is that when you chug down a bunch of these sports drinks or soda or juice to quote unquote hydrate yourself, it actually worsens your diarrhea. You get worsening diarrhea, you then chug more juice. And so it's a vicious cycle. Hypoosmolar fluids um, are things like water. Um, so believe it or not, if you chug down water, um, that can actually worsen your diarrhea. I know it's very counterintuitive, but when you drink a ton of water, it actually pulls sodium and water into your gut lumen and that increases your output. So I probably confused some people out there. I was confused myself when I started learning about fluid balance. So what is the solution? The solution are oral rehydration solutions, not just a hydration solution. It's an ORS solution. These things are basically um, kind of certified by the, the World Health Organization, where it has the perfect amount or the perfect ratio of sodium and glucose. And what it does is, is when you have that correct ratio, you're actually able to um, activate the sodium glucose transport system, these receptors in your small intestine that help you reabsorb more fluid and more electrolytes. So that would be things like Pedialyte, but there's a lot of other pre-made solutions out on the market. But when you're looking for these things, you want them to say on the label that they are an ORS solution, and that is very critical. Um, now, that doesn't mean you should chug down these solutions. Again, any fluid, if you take in tons and tons at a time, that it's just going to run right through you. So really what I tell people is get an ORS solution that you like, that's palatable, and you just sip on that throughout the day, and that should really, really help. This does not mean that you can never drink water. It just means that if you chug down tons of water, don't be surprised if it actually worsens your diarrhea. Um, so again, these ORS solutions have the correct ratio of sodium and glucose. You're activating these, uh, these pumps that are in your small intestine and that allows for more rapid fluid reabsorption. This was adapted from uh, UVA Health System. These are actually homemade oral rehydration recipes. So let's say you don't like Pedialyte and let's say you really like apple juice. Well, as long as you get a cup of apple juice, you add the appropriate amount of water and the appropriate amount of salt, you can actually create your own. So these are different recipes that you can do with chicken broth or rice cereal or tomato juice or Gatorade. Um, but again, you have to make sure that you're adding the exact amounts of these um, of the sugar and the salt and water in order to, to reach those correct ratios. Um, so some dietary tips overall on beverages is, again, I'm not saying you can't have water, although I am saying you should not be having soda, but no one should really be drinking soda, um, but really trying to limit liquids that can worsen your output. So that's going to be your hypoosmolar solutions like your water and your hyperosmolar solutions like your soda, alcohol, excessive caffeine, artificial sweeteners. Although we often promote protein supplementation, just remember that a lot of these protein drinks have too much um, either sugar or too much salt or not the right combination and can worsen diarrhea um, and really limit the simple sugars and juices. Um, eating uh, uh, tips would be when you're eating, actually try to only have sips of liquids with your solids. The majority of your liquids should be in between meals, not with your meals. You want to, again, chew your food very well in order to maximize digestion and absorption. Eating small, frequent meals throughout the day, that will vary from person to person on what's truly realistic, but really, at least in the beginning, about six times a day of smaller meals to kind of assess tolerance. You want to start with more refined carbs, and then as you your intestine adapts, you can definitely start to reintroduce slowly those complex carbs, um, and again, prioritizing that protein, and then having ORS solutions on hand, either pre-made 
or your own that you make at home that you can kind of sip on throughout the day. It may be that if you have a colostomy and you only have 400 mLs of output, that you don't need an ORF solution, and that is totally fine and all the power to you. But it just means that if you end up on some days having higher output, it's good to have something like that on hand just in case. Um, so how do we assess and maximize hydration? Um, so we really want to obviously maintain our urine output to over a liter per day. You want to be able to maintain your weight within a kilo per week. Um, so we don't want you obviously losing 10 pounds a week because things are just rushing right through you that you can't absorb the fluid and the calories. We obviously want your heart rate and your blood pressure to be good and your creatinine, your kidney function to remain normal. Um, again, sipping on the ORS solutions throughout the day can be very helpful to prevent dehydration. And in order to prevent um, kidney stones, again, hydration is very important. Um, but um, if you have a colon intact, you actually want to avoid um, high oxalate foods. So this kind of goes over their percentages. I think it's obviously, it can be overwhelming for a lot of people to give someone percentages and say, I want you to target 2000 calories per day. And I want your carbs to be 50% of your total daily calories, your protein 20 and your fat 20. You know, I want X amount of this and Y amount of that. It can be very overwhelming. But these are definitely some good percentages that if you're tracking in an app, this can be very helpful to make sure that you're reach, that you're um, kind of reaching what your targets would be. So if your colon is present, the carbs um, are a little bit higher and the fat is a little bit lower. If your colon is absent, then the fat percentages kind of what we recommend are just a little bit higher. So it varies a little bit based on whether your colon is present or absent. Most people aren't really tracking their calories, so this may or may not um, be too much information for some patients. Um, so this is actually on my website um, where it has animal sources, their protein and plant-based sources. You do not have to eat animal products in order to reach your protein requirements. So as your uh, intestine adapts, you will be able to start introducing more plant-based protein options, but you have to do it slowly because a lot of these options also have a lot of fiber. So you want to be careful with that. So if you want to introduce nuts, then a better option to start with would be like almond butter or peanut butter. And then once you're adapting and you're, you're assessing your tolerance, then maybe you could have some almonds. Things like spinach and kale, your greens have some protein in there, mushrooms. You can add things like hemp protein powder or pea protein, soy-based products. Um, really try to avoid these plant-based items that are very processed, like your vegan cheeses or your impossible burgers. They have a million ingredients and, and a lot of saturated fat and other harmful, harmful things. So just to meet your protein requirements, there are ways to do it where you don't have to eat animal products. As long as you, again, have a strategy, you can meet your requirements with plant-based protein options. And then this is um, another kind of list that I created on my site where it's this virtual grocery list that you can actually print out a PDF of. And so this will kind of take you through different categories. They are all um, pretty much low sugar options. Um, and it takes you, whether it's fruit or high carb veggie options, low carb veggie options, animal-based protein options, or plant-based protein options, et cetera. The, the ones that are in blue can cause bloating. So as you're introducing foods, those are not ones you would want to start with. And the ones that are in red can cause heartburn. So this can be a helpful list for people as they start to reintroduce foods on what are good options and what things to start with and maybe leave the others for when they're reconnected or, or feeling kind of back to their baseline. Um, and then this is from... Um, uh, this is kind of goes over again, a lot of what I've already gone over, but um, as you're reintroducing new foods, you know, really limiting your gas producing, your odor producing foods, ones that have a lot of fiber and cause diarrhea, um, this can kind of help guide people on that introduction, but it's variable from person to person. And so that's why this can be very challenging um, after surgery, but it's doable. It's absolutely doable as long as you um, are aware of a lot of these things and that things are going to change from week to week. Um, so that is all I have, and we'll open it up to questions and kind of go from there. <laughs>